Well, thank you for your very warm welcome, David. I'm so glad my wife wasn't sitting next to me because she might have asked, did you write the text for what he just said? Or do you recognize half of what he said uh, about you? That's the great thing about having constructively critical Welsh wives. But I'm very glad that you've... <laughs> I'm very glad you've come here this morning uh, to listen to me speaking in Wenglish, that is Welsh English. And uh, what you'll find is that Welsh speakers, as they get more excited, they speak faster and faster. And usually you're either caught up with the rise and fall, the intonation of the voice, or it sends you to sleep. <clears throat> and some years ago I was speaking, unfortunately, in an evangelistic meeting in Paris where I was living. And it was a, on the theme of freedom, search for freedom in the Western world, and a, an American lady was listening, and afterwards she came up to me and said, I love your voice. Give me your itinerary. I want to follow you around the world. And I, I said, well, why do you want to follow me around the world? Thinking she was going to say, because I like your preaching. She said, I want to follow you around the world because before I came here tonight, I haven't slept for six weeks. <laughs> but within five minutes of you getting up to speak, I was gone. The reason I want to follow you is you were the answer to my insomnia. So uh, I hope I'm not the answer to your insomnia here over the next couple of days. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the, uh, the majority world this morning. Because my brief is actually to speak about the European situation, where I'm spending most of my time working at the moment. My own background is as a, as a historian, and uh, therefore over lunch I'm going to speak about the legacy of the Reformation, because it's the 500th anniversary of the Reformation in the next few weeks, and particularly John Calvin's missionary vision, which is being reinterpreted by many historians now. But tomorrow I'm going to look at a Bible passage where we look at five key principles or guidelines uh, for the kind of people that God uses, which I think are biblical principles for all times and whatever uh, vocation. Anyway, this morning we're going to jump straight in to look at the context, the European context, and to ask what's happening there. Why is it so difficult for the gospel to advance there? Because it's advancing in many other parts of the world quite rapidly. And to ask, I'm hoping you will ask yourselves, um, what can we learn from this analysis of the European context? And what are the implications for Christian witness, particularly uh, in North America uh, in the decades to come? Doug Birdsell was mentioned, uh, who's sitting here, and he, Doug is uh, fond of quoting the passage from 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, uh, which speaks about the men of Issachar, a group of people in uh, David's, King David's army, of whom it was said that they were men who had an understanding of the times and knew what to do. Notice those two things. Analysis isn't enough. Some Christians love analyzing, but that's not enough. They analyzed and understood the times, and they knew what to do. And that second dimension is really critical. That's often the best, that's where the best workers come from. Try to understand the cultural and the intellectual context and then work out how to uh, act in that context. So I'm going to speak therefore about three things in the next 25 minutes. First of all, uh, reasons for encouragement in Europe. Secondly, the spiritual context of Europe and the challenges we face and why we have them. And thirdly, briefly, how then could or should we uh, and how are some of us trying to respond? So the European context, is it a lost cause or an open door? Somebody said to me in a phone call recently, should we just give up on Europe? Everywhere else the church seems to be advancing, but Europe seems to be pretty deadly and dead. Uh, Christians are in despair. The church is shrinking. Uh, is there much that can be done there? Should we just concentrate on China and India, Latin America, Middle East and other parts of the world where the church seems to be growing? And just forget about those poor old boring uh, Europeans. Well, actually, there are some reasons for encouragement uh, in the European context. It isn't a block, it's a mosaic of cultures. So we need to be careful about speaking in overly generalized terms about the, the context in Europe. But there are reasons for encouragement. Ralph Winter, who taught here uh, in the past, used to argue that there were Three great periods in the history of mission, 1792 and onwards with William Carey and those who followed him, then 1865 with Hudson Taylor, China Inland Mission and those who followed him, and then just before and post Second World War, Donald McGavran uh, and others like Cam Townsend who formed Wycliffe Bible Translators. And he wrote a book about it called The 25 Unbelievable Years. I think that was written in the 
1980s. I would argue there are two other great periods in church history. Perhaps the greatest is the period 1989 to the present day. We have never in history seen any uh, uh, advance of the gospel in so many cultures as we have in the last 25, uh, 30 years. And I'll come back to that in the other uh, sessions. Uh, but it ha doesn't seem to have affected Europe as much. The other is the latter part of the Reformation, particularly Calvin, which I'll speak, at, speak about at lunchtime. But there have been some implications for the advance of the gospel in Europe post-1989 with the breakup of the Soviet Union. Many of you weren't probably uh, born at that time. But I remember praying for Albania when I was working with Operation Mobilization, praying that God would create a church there, knowing that there were only six known Albanian Christians in the world in the 1980s. All of them living out, three of them living in one town in Albania, three outside. But post-89, with the breakup of the communist system, Albania had the tightest country in the world, led by a guy called Enver Hoxha, who was influenced by Maoism. Uh, very restrictive. He tried to wipe out all religious presence, not just Christian, but other religions too, and was pretty successful. These days, there are about 14,000 evangelical Christians, people who seek to live under the authority of Scripture in the country, from zero virtually in 1989. Now, David encouraged people to go on these short-term teams, and actually one of the lessons I learned in, as a student in university was in my first year, an Irish guy said to me, Lindsay, treat your summer vacations as part of your preparation for the whole of the rest of the life. So he said, my advice to you is go on a different team with a different agency every summer, which I did. I encourage you to do the same. You learn a lot about yourself and about missions. And I went to Israel one year, I went to Romania another, I went to Corsica in France uh, a third. And some of these short-term teams, more happens in the lives of the individuals, but some happens through the teams in the culture. One is Albania. In 1983-4, when Hodja, the president, died, at that time a short-term team was going from Seattle, from a church there, Presbyterian church, to help for six weeks in Belgrade, which was the capital of Yugoslavia. Well, the stretch of geography, don't worry about it, since in southeastern Europe. They flew overnight from Seattle to Athens in Greece, where they were going to change planes. When they arrived there, they saw on the screens that uh, there was chaos on the streets because there was fighting, a civil war had broken out. So they phoned back to their missions pastor and said, there's fighting in uh, Belgrade, what should we do? He said, go to Tirana in Albania instead. The president's just died, there's chaos on the streets. Go to the university, offer to teach English as a foreign language, and use the Bible as your text, and see what God does. They said, where's Albania? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, it's just south of Yugoslavia, cast the first plane there. So they caught it, they went to the university, a group of about 15 of them. They taught English as a foreign language through the Bible for six weeks. About 10 people professed faith. One of them today is the leader of the student ministry, uh, but he was a linguist. And uh, he's also the vice president of the Evangelical Alliance in the country. About 10 years after he was converted, he realized they didn't have a good equivalent of the New Testament in the Albanian language. So because he was a brilliant linguist, he took a year off, learned New Testament Greek in a year. How many professors would like students like that? And then he translated the whole of the New Testament in a few years, which is used today. All of that started from a summer program. So, folks, you want to see much more than 50 going on those teams. In the summer, you can never tell what God will do through them. But uh, Albania is an example. The impact of the diaspora of people from other cultures coming to Europe has also led to uh, many people groups who were relatively unreached hearing the gospel. We're in the Christie Wilson Center. Just last Monday, I was meeting with somebody from Germany who was telling me last week was a week in Germany focusing on Afghans for Christ. He said, you won't believe this, but last week there were meetings in 560 locations across Germany alone of either Af Afghan believers or seekers. Now, when I was unaware many years ago, I remember a missionary coming to the Logos ship on which I was and asking how, how many believers there are in Afghanistan. He said about 25. It's amazing what's happening amongst Afghans and Iranians as people had dispersed across uh, Europe. The fastest growing church in Europe is in France. In France, in 1910, there were only 4,000 known evangelicals. When I lived there in the 1980s, there were about 200. Today, there are more than half a million. And Philip Jenkins, in his books on Europe, 
and his writings on France argues, and French leaders concur this with this. I met with two of the senior leaders last Monday, uh, the same day, and um, they said the evangelical church is over 500,000 and growing. And his argument is it's grown for three reasons. One is because a strong church planting movement was born in the late 1970s, which is now integrated into the vision of all the churches. Second is the influence of the charismatic movement. Some weaknesses, but it's broken up the ground. The third is the impact of the diaspora. People moving to France from Africa, from Cambodia, from Vietnam, from the Caribbean, as well as Western missionaries, have contributed to the advance of the gospel. The church is mainly the church of the lower-income poor folks. It's hardly penetrated the universities very effectively, unlike in the UK where the church is more middle-class because so many middle-class professionals were converted as students. But there's encouragements there uh, in France. Church planting initiatives born in France are now spread all across Europe. There's a dynamic network the last 10 years which has spawned many new churches in France, Norway, Germany, uh, Netherlands, Sp UK, Spain, and other places. Then there are youth missions conferences, not exactly modeled on the Urbana model, but uh, one last year, which takes place every three years, called Pro Christ in Germany. 30,000 students and young people involved across the country, and then 300 mission weeks all across the country, reaching young people, and screened on television screens to 10 neighboring countries uh, in Europe. So there's a lot of dynamic developments across Europe. It's not all black and difficult, for which we can give thanks to God. Yet it is a tough country, and I would say we haven't yet seen major breakthroughs in terms of spectacular growth in numbers or revival movements. Why is that the case? And that leads me to the second comment. You have to put your thinking caps on, because I'm going to try to offer a brief analysis of why Europe is as it is today, because of two influences. First of all, as we mentioned, the Reformation occurred on European soil 500 years ago. It's profoundly impacted your culture. America wouldn't be what it is today without the Reformation, and people influenced by the Reformation coming over here, uh, seeking religious freedom and a new life and so on. So your whole culture is penetrated, almost without you realizing it, by some of the things that came out of the Reformation. In many uh, in, in a pervasive way across the culture, religious liberty, toleration, uh, music, um, uh, rights of women, education, uh, so many things. I'll speak briefly about it at lunchtime. A deep and penetrating impact on Europe, and it's amazing that it's long-term, I think because it was spurred on and encouraged beyond the initial Reformation period by a series of revivals across the continent in Germany, in Norway, by people, folks here have never heard of, uh, uh, Hans, Hans Christian Hauge, for example. Uh, in Wales, where I come from, a whole series of revivals refueled the impact of the Reformation. And in Germany, it happened through a group of people called Pietists. Uh, Count von Zinzendorf was one, Jakob Spener was another. The Pietists were famous for focusing on devotion to the person of Jesus, but they had a weak spot. It wasn't so much Spain, but the people who followed him, and this is critical for North America and Europe, they turned in on themselves because of fear of being corrupted by the world. So they misunderstood the biblical injunction to be in the world and said there are areas of society we have nothing to do with, like politics, for example, and turned, or, or, uh, or accountants, or estate agents, uh, or investment bankers. It's not possible to be a Christian witness here. That was the implication. So they turned in on themselves, not so much in the first generation, but subsequently. John Stott has said in the past, the calling of the global church is to remain distinctively distinctive in our morality without, without disengaging socially. And the mistake often the church has made is arguing we can only remain distinctive in terms of our morality, if we cut ourselves off from the world. So historically, the church has always struggled through our history. This is why it's important, very important for all Christians to be historians. Martin Luther said, there's nothing so short as the Christian's memory. And uh, we make mistakes time and time again because we don't remember the lessons from the history of the church. And one of the lessons is that in our approach to the, to the world, we've had one of three approaches. Separation, which has been the dominant historical view. 
It has no biblical foundation. The second is uh, assimilation of the world into the church, which is a reaction. The third is engagement, being morally distinctive without being socially segregated. And our theological basis for that is the incarnation of Jesus, who came and dwelt amongst us, who didn't say to his father, I don't mind going into the world, but they're so dirty, please can I go in a space suit, because I don't want to be corrupted by them. <laughs> but that's how some Christians behave. We're afraid of the world, so we retreat. This led to a form of dualism, which separated what we do on Sunday and Monday, viewed worship as only the singing of worship songs on Sunday, not the engagement of the whole of life in terms of Christian witness. It led to a downplaying of the theology of the workplace, which was one of the key rediscoveries of Luther. Strong emphasis on vocation, not just the priests, but engagement in every area of society was a strong emphasis of Luther. It led to a depreciation of what uh, some of the reformers called the Christian mind, by which I mean an attempt to apply biblical truth to every area of society. One of the great proponents of this was a successor of Calvin, Abraham Kuyper in, in uh, Amsterdam, founder of the Free University of Amsterdam, who said, there's not one centimeter of human existence to which Christ, who is Lord of all, does not point and say, that is mine. But many Christians don't go that far. They stop short. But there are very few jobs which are obviously immoral. Sex trafficking, prostitution. Many others are not where our Christian presence is needed. It led in Europe to a separation in theological education between doctrine and praxis. So the crisis in theological education in institutions like this in Europe is we're really strong on systematic theology and doctrine. But you ask people, how does it apply in daily living, and we are weak, which has huge implications for pastoral ministry, because people don't know how to help people with their practical, everyday human struggles, because we've separated doctrine from praxis. I'm not saying that's one of your problems, but it is one of us in Europe. Now, one of the consequences, as I say, was assimilation, which led to uh, a failure to combat alternative worldviews, particularly in the 1800s, and it led to liberal theology, which has wrecked the European church and diminished the power of its testimony. Now, alongside that impact then, what happened was that the legacy of the Reformation was continued from 1517 through to about 1850 because it was refueled by regular revivals. But by about 1850, you have the first signs that the church is turning in on itself saying that there are areas of society which are no-go for Christian witness, including the visual arts, for example, which is where we're the weakest in the world. In IFES, for which I work, there are half a million students involved worldwide. 75% are, are scientists. 25% are doing the arts or the humanities, history, which is what I did, or literature or philosophy or politics or economics. That's where the church's testimony is actually weakest globally. We had a conference for European artists recently and all in France. Only three French people turned up. I asked them why there's so few French Christian artists. They said because of the teaching of the church. They're encouraging everybody to do IT because it's practical. And so they, even with the rich tradition of the visual arts, there's very little teaching in, in terms of how to develop a Christian mind in that sphere which discourages believers who are working in that area. And the more sensitive believers then drop out later on because they can't see how the Scriptures apply to their sphere of life. Now, alongside this influence, uh, you had the impact of what was called historically the Enlightenment about 250 years ago. I don't want to do the great depth here, but the great thinkers were Voltaire, Rousseau, and others, and they basically sidelined God. They didn't want anything to do with God being in the center of the picture, shaping the, the, the culture and the lives of individuals. They pushed Him to the extremity, they said man is the center of the universe and he should be free to do whatever he wants. The children of the Enlightenment were hedonism, pleasure orientation, materialism, not necessarily that matter is all that there is, but what matter is primarily what matters, and pluralism, perhaps the biggest challenge of the 21st century. Postmodernity is a grandchild of pluralism. I don't think it will last personally because an alternative worldview must offer the illusion of two things to captivate a culture. Here they are. If a worldview does not offer the illusion of hope 
and freedom, those two doesn't last. The last alternative worldview, which stuck and held in Europe for a long time, was Marxism, because it offered the illusion of both. Postmodernity really offers the illusion of freedom, but it's without hope. So you won't survive. And it's really the wagging tail. It's the end of the process coming out of the Enlightenment, that period of time and that worldview which denied the centrality of God uh, in our lives. One of the consequences in Europe is it led to a loss of wonder, which is why you have Europe-pessimism and not Americo-pessimism. Jacques Ellul, the famous French sociologist, said, the three most influential thinkers which shaped modern Europe were Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud. Only Freud had any influence through ther therapy in North America. But he said, what was common to all three of them, and hear this, he said, is that they discouraged a positive faith in anything, so they were the fathers of European pessimism. And went on, he went on to say, pessimism and wonder can't sleep in the same bed together. It's not possible. And you know that a culture is losing its sense of wonder when 13-year-olds do not have any sense of wonder about anything. Not just a sense of wonder about the gospel. And sometimes it influences our lives as believers, and it's good to ask, do I have this sense of the wonder of the gospel and the wonder of God's creation, or have I lost it? And uh, it's tragic to see younger and younger people losing that sense of wonder. It's very, very attractive. Anyway, uh, one of the uh, other consequences or hallmarks was uh, atheism and the new atheism, which has flown out of the Enlightenment period. Um, it's taken root in Britain and here, very little impact in continental Europe because they think it's hollow, uh, they think it's empty, they think it's negative. And they say of uh, people like Richard Dawkins who attacks Christianity regularly, why are you getting so emotional if it's not true? If it's not true, just you know, keep your temper under control. Doesn't have much respect in Germany where they're deeper thinkers than the Anglo-Saxons. Uh, they think the English are lightweight in Germany. Well, there's some truth in that too. Being Welsh, I can say that. But in response then, what are some of the bridges to connect with people? Because in Europe these days, as we do university mission weeks, I work with a team of 60 university evangelists who this year will do week-long missions in 190 or 200 universities across the continent. We find we need to engage in what we call relational apologetics, by which I mean an attempt to connect with people with their felt needs and apply biblical truth to those felt needs. Let me give an example. The desire for freedom, for human flourishing, for transcendence, answer to suffering, community, and hope. I went to visit John Stott just before he died and asked him, John, what do you think people are looking for in the Western world today? He said, I think most people are looking for three things. A sense of significance, a sense of community, and a sense of the transcendent. Is there someone out there on my alone? So we speak regularly on those things in universities. When we address the issue of freedom, we try to highlight the fact that the Western world, Jim Packer said, if the Western world is dominated by anything, it's a desire for freedom. But there are two competing notions. There's the freedom that comes from the Enlightenment, which argues men and women must be free to do whatever they want without any restraints, except you mustn't hurt anybody. You can't live like that. What they're wanting is freedom without limits. The other freedom is the freedom which comes from the Reformation from the Scriptures, which is freedom within a framework. As one uh, preacher said, it's like a fish in the oceans of the sea. You put a fish in the water, it can swim for thousands of kilometers. It has choice. When you take the fish out of the sea, put it in an environment for which it was not created, it dies. Similarly, human beings have great choice, so long as they're related to the framework which God gives them as a loving Heavenly Father. You take them out of that environment, Something happens to them, they die spiritually. Human flourishing is another theme we pick up, especially with people struggling in the area of sexuality, trying to positively respond to it. Transcendence, that's why you have Madonna saying she's into Kabbalah, Richard Gere into Buddhism, uh, they all, or Tom Cruise into Scientology. They all say, I'm a spiritual person, which is not the same as saying I'm a Christian. It means I'm interested in the transcendent, and that's a bridge for people because they sense there must be something more that they need to engage with. Suffering is a key issue everywhere. The search for community. We're in danger of the idolatry of friendship in our culture, uh, focusing in the Facebook generation. Friendship is important, but what people are looking for 
when they're trying to gather lots of friends on Facebook is community. And the strange thing is that in a world where there's much more communication, there's less community living. And we were made that way. And as John Stott said to me, people are looking for a sense of significance, community, and transcendence. And the church has the answer to all three. But we need to proclaim it and engage with people. Well, I could speak also about uh, hope and uh, some other areas, but time has gone. So let me close by suggesting then how we can or should try to respond. There isn't a slick answer. Some of these things are in your culture already, and some of them are going to hit you like a train in the future. And so we need to think, not just understand the times, even if you slightly disagree with some of my analysis, but how then should we live? First of all, let me point you to one of the great missiologists in the history of the American church, Kenneth Scott Latourette, who taught in Yale and wrote a brilliant series of six volumes in 1978 on the history of the expansion of Christianity. In there, he talks about the six weapons in the Christian armory for engaging right across 2,000 years of the history of the church. And he argues they were prayer, evangelism, example, argument, action, and suffering. I would love to give a talk on that tomorrow, but I can't, because I'm asked to speak on something else. But I think it's a great model for how we should live today with examples. Just two or three other things as I close that we should consider. The gospel must be proclaimed publicly. And many Americans have lost their nerve when it comes to public proclamation and dive into small groups and what they call friendship evangelism. Excuse me for being so direct, but I've only got two minutes left. Um, no culture has ever been transformed by small group discussions. You only transform a culture when you win the argument in public, and there's something about public proclamation which is incisive and like a sword, searing right into the soul. If you look historically at the Reformation, Calvin and Luther proclaimed the gospel in the universities in Europe. Harnack, the great German historian, said the early church grew between the end of the New Testament and Constantine because of two things. They outlived the pagans and they out-argued them. They won the argument in public. So you have to have the public proclamation of the gospel. That's why in Europe we are focused very much on get into the universities. You have to stand up and be counted. You've got to answer those questions and show that the gospel is more powerful than the alternative worldview. But in addition to the gospel being proclaimed, uh, we have to secondly win the argument in public. And this is often where Christian church has been weak. We are maybe strong on proclamation, particularly those who come from a, a reformed or Calvinistic background. But often where the weakness occurs is we are weak at applying the whole of Scripture to the whole of life. And in order for a culture to be transformed, we must do both. That's why the Cape Town Commitment, which came out of the Cape Town Congress that David, Doug, and I, and others were on in 2010, said that the purpose of the conference and the Cape Town Commitment document was to call the global church to bear witness to Jesus Christ and all His teaching in every area of the world geographically and in every sphere of society, including the realm of ideas. What happened from 1850 on in Europe was a retreat from the university and from the public sphere with the failure of confidence amongst the leaders to demonstrate the gospel at that the biblical worldview had superior answers to the issue of economics uh, or the treatment of women or the poor or any area of culture and society. And the answers are there. I'll speak a little bit about it at, uh, at lunchtime. But we must do both. Vigorous proclamation of the gospel, incisive and sharp, but the application of the whole of Scripture to every area of life. For example, the Old Testament is like, it's like a book on creation, care, and management. The Mosaic law, the, Moses of, the law of Moses, is full of references to care for creation and the animals, and yet we neglect it. I don't want to be controversial there, but I'm trying to highlight the fact that the Scriptures apply to every sphere of life. So we must engage in public, in social media, in the universities, in television, uh, in newspapers, and on the radio. That's why Martin Luther, even in 1523, said, if you want to change the world, start with the university, when there were only 10 in Germany. And Charles Malik, the one-time general secretary of the UN in 1981, 
uh, gave a series of six blindingly brilliant lectures entitled Christ and the University, and he said the same thing, almost quoting Luther verbatim. If you want to change society, start with the university. We have to engage where people are thinking in order for to see them transformed and culture transformed subsequently too. And then when we do that, we need to develop alternative, attractive communities. And no one has written better about that than Rodney Stark, the sociologist in Washington University, who argues in his analysis of the early church post-New Testament was that it grew for three reasons. One is the message they preached. Second is the way they treated women. Nothing to do with feminism or women in leadership, but they treated women with dignity, so they flocked to the churches. You read the chapters on how the early church treated women. I tell you, it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand on end. You feel so proud to be a Christian because of the stance the early church leaders took. And sometimes I think, why couldn't we do the same today? What's gone wrong? Uh, but the third was how they cared for people who were weak and suffering. And how many elders and leaders died because they're going out into the streets rescuing people affected by early diseases like measles. And even the pagan emperor Julian said, unless we copy these believers, these followers of Jesus, they'll, they'll defeat pagans, which is what happened. And so the third dimension is not only but gospel proclamation, application of the, gospel, the biblical truth to the whole area of society, and development of communities, and then salt and light. And all that has to be done in a spirit of prayerfulness and perseverance, not giving up. We are too short-term. That's why Eugene Peterson was right to write the book about Christian discipleship, calling it a long obedience in the same direction. We have to view the Christian life as a marathon, not as a 30-meter sprint. There is room for short-term things. But in your life, give at least 25, 30 years to building something. Don't just do 10 three-year projects for your working life. You can't build very much in three years. Give your lives an energy. Ask God to give you a clear sense of vocation and give your energies to building. And you'll see some of the fruit over three decades. It's the main advantage of being over 60 is that you see what God's done over a 40, 50-year period. Let me close with one quotation from Robert Bella, probably the leading sociologist of religion in the world today, who wrote this. The quality of a culture may be transformed if only 2% of the people share the same vision for a just and a gentle society. You're more than 2%, I suspect. We're not in Wales. But even when you're a small minority, when you're on the same page in terms of the, the compelling truth, wonder, and glory, and greatness of the gospel, and the application and the relevance of biblical truth to every area of society, is transformative. So let's not manifest a loss of wonder and cynicism. Let's engage deliberately, wholeheartedly, passionately, with conviction, and see our, trans our culture and other cultures, for those of us God calls to serve overseas, transformed too. Thank you.